Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Distinguished guests, colleagues, and friends, welcome to the Global Diaspora Summit 2022. IOM is so thrilled to co-host this unique event with the Government of Ireland, a country with a long-standing tradition and passion in connecting with its diaspora community, a vibrant Irish diaspora counting some 70 million people. The comprehensive approach to diaspora engagement of the Irish government fully resonates with IOM's vision. So why is this summit so important at this point in time? 10 years have passed since the last time diaspora and development ministers met in Geneva at the IOM, International Dialogue on Migration. And so much has happened that has highlighted the role diaspora plays as a key actor in shaping the international migration agenda. The most evident is certainly the adoption of the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration. The GCM recognizes the importance of creating the space and the conditions for diaspora engagement and therefore provides a framework for action, a framework that will help building a lasting and trusting relationship rather than remembering engaging the diaspora for support only when it's needed. More, diaspora plays a key role when it comes to representing a trusted voice in reaching out to migrants, and this includes, yes, sharing information on safe and legal migration opportunities and helping facilitate the access to these, but also, and very importantly, alerting them to the dangers of embarking on unsafe journeys, the risks of exploitation, trafficking, and smuggling. This is not only an opportunity to save lives, it is a responsibility that we all bear. Diasporas have demonstrated a role during the COVID-19 pandemic, during which migrants were seen as those essential workers, supplying the missing doctors and nurses or agricultural workers across the world. And diasporas are playing an essential role in the current Ukrainian crisis, not only by providing technical expertise one example is IOM's Mental Health and Psychosocial Support Hotline, which now runs inside Ukraine thanks to Ukrainian psychologists in the diaspora, but also by engaging the diaspora of third country nationals in Ukraine who are not able to leave the country because they have no means to do so and are vulnerable. The virtual diaspora networks are the only ones able to reach these migrants providing them information on how they can access help and in their language. So let's take advantage of our three days together to share experiences and lessons learned, but more importantly, to identify concrete ways to increase partnerships with the diaspora, to engage strategically in policy development and the response on the ground. Let us make sure that the outcome document we are aiming for can bring the gist of our discussions and our commitments to the first International Migration Review Forum, which is only a few weeks away. It's truly a unique opportunity that we have to bring the migrants' voice into the IMRF. I wish us all a highly successful and productive summit, which we hope is the first of many more to come. Thank you. Hello and welcome to Dublin. 
Ireland is proud to have been asked to host this Global Diaspora Summit of the Member States of the International Organisation for Migration. This is an important summit. It takes place against the tragic resurgence of conflict-driven migration and of growing environmental threats, particularly through climate change. In addressing these challenges, the global diaspora is a vital but overlooked source of support and know-how. Our diaspora are communities forged through hardship, both in their home and host countries. It's made them strong and resilient. They are communities that look to give back, to contribute to places that they and their family left, as well as the places where they have made their new home. Their stories and experiences are the connective tissue of humanity, crossing countries, cultures, and often generations. As we see today in the case of Ukraine, the global diaspora is providing vital humanitarian support and shelter to others forced to abandon their homes. I believe that this summit will strengthen the important contribution that our global diaspora can make to a more peaceful and prosperous world. And I wish you all the best in your deliberations over the coming days. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, um, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It's a pleasure to have you here at today's session. Uh, Diaspora Humanitarianism, COVID-19 as a Breakthrough Movement. Uh, my name is Bashar Ahmed. I'm the CEO at Shabaka, a research and consulting organization focused on diaspora humanitarianism. And I have the privilege to be the moderator for this session. Uh, just a, a kind of a quick background to the importance of this session. And, and it's, it's great we're gonna hear also from our speakers about this topic. So there is a growing body of evidence that shows diasporas are becoming and are crucial actors in humanitarian action and development uh, through their financial or non-financial contributions. Diaspora networks, knowledge, expertise, and resources are valuable assets that has allowed them to be act as a bridge between the different actors and more importantly with the communities we seek to serve as well. Um, and we've seen this remarkable role uh, with the diaspora communities on the front lines of many services and support during COVID-19 pandemic but also diaspora response to peace building, humanitarianism, and being the first stop for engagement um, of diaspora to think strategically about ways to, uh, there can be a positive um, change um, uh, at home and abroad. And, um, and I think this is why this kind of discussions are quite important, not just to see diaspora just within the lens of development, but also humanitarianism. And there's a lot of that learning and also the bringing of the humanitarian and development nexus. So, that kind of opening towards non-traditional humanitarian actors and that kind of collaboration is quite important. Um, so uh, this is kind of like just a gist of the discussion, but uh, our uh, speakers will be providing off, obviously, uh, really unique insights into that. Uh, just some notices for this session. Firstly, please um, note uh, that uh, there will be opportunities for to put some questions in the chat functions and such. Uh, there's also interpretations available in all uh, six languages. So in Arabic, French, Spanish, uh, Russian, English. Um, so if uh, just check on the bottom of the screen and you'll find the interpretations options. Um, secondly, um, and I think we're all very familiar with the online world nowadays. However, I'll just be grateful if you can just ensure that you mute yourself when you're not speaking. Um, this will just ensure that the, there's a quality of the sound. And also when you're asking questions later, uh, please just keep your comments short, tell out for broader participation. We want to hear from everyone uh, at this session today. And finally, please don't shy away from uh, contributing, uh, even if we're asking you to make comments and questions shorter, but please, uh, your thoughts thoughts are really important to ensuring this kind of discussions uh, take forward. Um, and with that, I will just uh, uh, stop. Um, what I wanted to do is to introduce our first speaker, uh, Mingo Heidiko. Um, uh, Heidiko, and uh, she's been working in the humanitarian development sector since 2007 and for the past decade with a specific focus on supporting effective diaspora engagement in the field. So as her function uh, as head of unit at the Danish Refugee Council, Civil Society Engagement Unit and its diaspora program, uh, Minga has developed strategies and leading programs and initiatives that have contributed substantially to the field of diaspora engagement. 
Um, this is particularly through development of DMAC initiative and several pushes for the uh, inclusion of diaspora in the overall humanitarian ecosystem. And uh, Minga has also played a, a, a leading role in ensuring an increased interest in the recognition of the value and impact of diaspora humanitarianism in the past years. Um, and uh, with that, uh, with no further ado, uh, Mingo, I will just hand over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Bashir. Uh, thank you for the kind words as well. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm really honored for the invitation to speak here today with such a number of relevant and important participants and partners present. Um, diaspora engagement and, and specifically diaspora emergency response has not just been my bread and butter for the past decade, but also one of my greatest passions. So I'm, I'm very, very glad to be able to, to share and, and to listen um, to this conversation today. Um, just maybe a caveat, I think though COVID has served as a very strong magnifying glass um, on the need for inclusivity and local ownership of humanitarian aid, and obviously also the strong value of diaspora engagement, I will not be speaking specifically about COVID-19 and diaspora, but will share some more general reflections um, and lessons learned from my work in this field. Um, I did prepare a presentation to just make sure I have some of the key concepts that, that, that come out of my reflections over the past years on screen. So I will try to share that. Let me see if it works. Definitely should. Here we go. Bashir, is it, uh, are you seeing something said at the beginnings? <laughs> yes, I am. Yes, yes. thank Great. you very much. Perfect. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Now, how does the switching work when I'm in this mode? Ah, yes, perfect. When I started working with this specific topic of diaspora engagement in conflict settings in uh, 2012, um, and even more specifically than with diaspora humanitarianism in 2015, diaspora engagement was actually completely unheard of um, in the formal humanitarian sector, as opposed to the development sector, where this has a much stronger and, and longer history. So myself coming from one of these formal humanitarian organizations, um, colleagues across the board actually looked quite quizzical and doubtful when I started talking to them about the value um, and the volume and the impact of diaspora engagement. So even my own manager kept asking me year after year, what was it again diaspora was and why was it we should be working with them? <laughs> so, uh, I mean, there's nothing wrong with continuously questioning the value of what we do. Um, but it did take quite some patience and a lot of good colleagues to offload on uh, in order to keep going in that kind of environment that was ignorant of this area of work, <laughs> at least when I started. Because as we all know, there was a dawning recognition that the formal humanitarianism uh, system couldn't cope with the rising needs alone and that it needed to take a very serious look at uh, itself and at uh, the way it could include other actors in the system and in the leadership of that system. So it's in that context, you could say, of the growing self-reflection on the shortcomings of the international system and the importance of having all hands on deck that I started working with the DMAC initiative and um, looking more specifically um, at how we can support and increase the recognition of the very significant role that diasporas play as part of the first response mechanism in almost any country across the world. So that has been quite a long and very fascinating journey. And I think I would like to share some reflections on what I think has made that a success. And, and I mean, we're far from there yet, but, but things are moving. So talking a little bit about what I think matters for diaspora support programs, um, as opposed to policymakers, etc. Some general reflections being um, that I think, I mean, a lot of diaspora support programs that I've been working with over the years are not necessarily run by diaspora organizations themselves. And personally, I don't see anything wrong with that, as long as you know who you are and what role you can play and what role you cannot play. So I think that's quite an important part to know your own role in, in, in this rather complex ecosystem. Um, initiatives like DMAC don't represent diaspora. They're not made up of diaspora, but they serve diaspora. They're supposed to build activities 
on diaspora's needs and the requirements. What we can do in initiatives like Denmark is to leverage the expertise and the networks and the power of the organizations we work with, of the organizations that host us, in this case, the Danish Refugee Council being one of the bigger humanitarian actors itself. It has a responsibility to share that power and to share its expertise and networks um, for the greater inclusion and inclusivity in the humanitarian system. And the same goes for all our partners um, in our advisory boards and reference groups that are made up of at least 50% diaspora and people from the formal humanitarian system. All of them have expertise, networks, and power to leverage on behalf of a greater inclusion of diaspora and humanitarian aid. And another thing that we are able to do is building bridges between the more institutionalized formal system and diaspora humanitarian responders. Then another thought and very strong personal experience as well, having, having continuously been engaged with the same partners and actors, technical expertise and support isn't enough uh, to create a successful engagement with diaspora from a non-diaspora perspective as well. To work successfully with diaspora is about building relationships and it's about building trust. Um, that in turn means that it's key to be utterly transparent about our actions and our engagement and its objectives, to be honest about what we're able to do and to be honest about what we are not able to do. Um, and we have to be accountable for what we do, not just to our donors, but even more so to our partners. And then even more so to the people that we're all there to serve when it's about humanitarian aid. Um, so I think also never to forget, ultimately, we're all a means to an end in humanitarian crises to the service of the people affected by the crisis. Um, so building of trust um, is also about knowing who you work with having a real curiosity as to the who and the why and the how of diaspora-led humanitarian response. You do need to build a very clear understanding of the context and of its dynamics. Because every crisis is different and, and so is every diaspora. One size fits no one and context is king, I think, in any work with diaspora engagement. And so it's true for many other engagements as well. And I also think it's quite important to stay on, to be there in the long run. I think short term, it's fashionable right now. Diaspora support projects rarely work. You need to have a long term engagement, the kind of engagement that builds relationships and understanding and expertise and trust. Another very important factor for diaspora engagement to work is to ensure ownership. And again, that's coming from the perspective of us being a service provider to diaspora engagement. They only work um, when there's real ownership in the diaspora. Um, that doesn't mean you have to be diaspora. It means you have to ensure that the support you offer builds on their active engagement and, and what they see as relevant and needed for their engagement to be the best it can be. Uh, an example currently, Ukraine has been mentioned many times. Um, we have weekly coordination meetings with a growing number of Ukrainian diaspora organizations, supporting them with the space to coordinate their emergency um, activities. And it's mainly by word of mouth that this group of people joining those coordination meetings is growing and the number of organizations joining that is growing. And that's because they feel they're part of building this network and building that kind of coordination to their response. Um, and I think another very key point to all of this, to all of the five points I'm mentioning here, is that this goes both ways. We also need to work with the same approach to trust, um, to understanding the context, to knowing our role, to ensuring ownership with the actors in the institutional humanitarian system. Because while we might at times feel that the system is a rather hegemonic, standardized and bureaucratic giant, it does consist of people, uh, most of whom, just like engaged diaspora, are trying to make a real difference for the people we are there to serve in a humanitarian crisis. So they also deserve that we engage with them with respect and trust and, uh, and accountability. I also have some general reflections from the operational end as to what I've seen work well and not work so well when it comes to policymakers, which I think is 
to a certain degree, the other end of the specter or one of the actors in this ecosystem of what makes diaspora engagement, engagement as impactful as it can be. Um, one of them is don't wait with developing policies and structures that include diaspora until A or the next emergency strikes. I think any partnering and collaboration should be strategic and deliberate, and it shouldn't wait until your hand is forced um, by crises. Uh, also key important to really include the diaspora and not just in a tokenistic way. They have to be part of developing policies and plans. And that work has to be based on respect and trust, and it has to be curious, and it has to be thought of as long-term. I have seen the rejection by diaspora of government policies on how to engage diaspora um, when they have felt that they had no involvement at all in what has been written down as expectations on their part uh, of what they should be doing um, in their countries of heritage. Another point to uh, not create gatekeepers, Strong individuals and organizations are often powerhouses for diaspora engagement, and, and, and they're good to invite, they're good to listen to, they bring all the skills, they bring the right words. But there's also the danger of um, them becoming darlings that potentially might limit our view to the diversity of strong actors and voices uh, that we should also allow to come to the fore. Um, don't instrumentalize diaspora. I think that's something we've seen again and again, not just by country of heritage um, policymakers, but also by country of residence uh, policymakers, trying to put diaspora in front of the wagon of something that the policymakers want to achieve. I think that's a, that's a road down to unsuccessful diaspora engagement because there's no ownership in that. Don't co-opt, but cooperate for real with trust, with respect, with curiosity as to what diaspora wants to do and where the common ground is to be found. Um, yeah, that was some of it for the policymakers. I also, I, am I running out of time or am I okay? Good, perfect. I also have some critical reflections. They come with our line of work. Oh, sorry, that should go back. Um, so coming from a humanitarian organization, I'm also working quite a lot with the bigger topics of uh, inclusivity, of localization of humanitarian aid, the importance of local organizations leading on resolving their crises, et cetera, to the largest degree possible. Um, the normative, normative and pragmatic need for that, for the ecosystem to ensure that. Um, and I think that's a key point for diasporas to remain aware of as well. What is their role in that localization discourse? Who is local and, 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 and what is diaspora in the local dynamics, et cetera? I think that's a key thing to at least reflect on and be well aware of. Because we have also have had situations where local organizations felt they were co-opted or dominated by diaspora organizations coming from their point of view, from the outside, being part of the social ecosystem, but yet not living in the country that they are responding to uh, crises in. So I think that's a key important, just a reflection point to never lose out of sight. Um, and then I also think, I keep telling myself and within our growing team on a daily basis, humanitarian aid is not supposed to be about competition. And I think it's, I mean, it's supposed to be about complementarity. It's supposed to be about putting affected people's needs first and foremost. And I think that is often proven to be far too easy to lose out of sight for all of us. Um, so that's also for every one of us to really always, I mean, keep that one in mind. Those were a couple of critical reflections. Very few. <laughs> I do have a thank you, a very big thank you, actually, to finish off with um, to all the very passionate, dedicated, tireless and amazing people that I have had the pleasure to meet and work with in the past decade diaspora and non-diaspora from within the system and without the system. I really want to say thank you for continuously humbling me and for remaining a seemingly bottomless well of inspiration. Um, I'm, yeah, thank you for that. It's what makes us tick. Thank you. That was it from my end. Um, All right, my go. Thank you so much. And uh, very insightful. I think we can have a whole day having a discussion about some of these points. Um, but uh, I'm sure we will get the opportunity to do that. And um, I really like the point about, you know, the need about the cooperations and all of that. Um, with that, uh, I will uh, go to our second speaker. Um,
I would like to welcome Mohammed Bashir Osman. Uh, he's a young, experienced entrepreneur and diaspora returnee working in Somalia's uh, printing and advertising market. He founded Daos Advertising Agency, an award-winning and leading creative firm specializing in design and advertising in Mogadishu. Apart from being a businessman, uh, he is also the chairman of the uh, Grega. So apologies about the pronunciation. So you might have to just correct me when you uh, uh, get to speak. Um, Orange, uh, Orange House, which is a Dutch Somali diaspora network organization based in Mogadishu, Somalia. Osman has extensive experience in photography, graphic design, media production, and communications. And he graduated from Region Isil and Media and Design College and returned to his hometown Mogadishu in 2015 to launch the Daos Agency. Osman has trained and hired a large number of young creative people in Somalia, and uh, he is a role model for many young Somalis. Um, he was also uh, been named as one of the most influential uh, young Africans in 2020. Uh, quite an impressive uh, background for a young person. So um, delighted to have you here and to learn about the experiences of coming back as a returnee uh, and such. So please go ahead. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, I hope you can hear me and uh, great greetings to everyone listening to this uh, wonderful uh, summit on diaspora humanitarianism. Um, as you just mentioned uh, or inter introduced me, my name is Mohammed Bashir Osman, I'm the German uh, of Guriga Orange, that is how we pronounce, which means literally Orange House in, uh, in English. Uh, the name contains a combination of two words, the Somali word of home, which means Guriga, and the uh, orange, which is the, the color of the, of the kingdom of the Netherlands. So the Orange House, we say it, Guriga Orange. Uh, Guru Orange uh, is a non diaspora, profit diaspora organization that aims to advocate, promote, uh, connect, and organize Dutch Somali communities in Somalia and the Netherlands. It was started in 2016 uh, by a small group of Dutch Somalis in Mogadishu. Um, Guru Orange consists largely uh, of entrepreneurs, uh, business in investors, and professionals who play an active role in the development of Somalia, economically, uh, politically, and socially. Uh, Orange House or Guriga Oranya builds bridges beyond the, between Somalia and the Netherlands. We aim to, facil to facilitate information and knowledge sharing to the Dutch and Somali companies and organizations, and to those looking for information about business investment opportunities in Somalia on different thematic areas to enable more effective policy and decision-making. Burigo Orange is a cooperation and information platform for the Dutch Somali citizens in Somalia that provides uh, lobbying and advocacy act activities on behalf of the Dutch Somali citizens in Somalia. Uh, we play an active, uh, actively, profi we, we provide actively relevant information on different thematic areas. Uh, we provide marketing information, marketing information about economic opportunities in Somalia. Uh, we support Dutch companies in creating and developing businesses. Uh, also assist in practical matters among members. Uh, we also organize quarterly member meetings and organize valuable network opportunities uh, and businesses uh, on field trips and visitors. So we also do uh, all necessary to assist both Dutch and everyone else that's interested in, in coming to Somalia and in between Somalia and the Netherlands. To give you a little bit of what we have uh, been working, we have been uh, closely following up the economical uh, overview uh, of, the, so of the Somalia and the Netherlands. And we see that uh, for the past, uh, like for the past four, four years that, that Guriga Orang was established, the uh, they are, we are, by the way, the, one of the very few diaspora organizations in Somalia uh, that aim to uh, uh, actually build a community uh, from the host country coming to the origin country, contributing to both bilateral relationships of the two countries uh, that we, you know, we are from originally. So, it's the Somalia and, and the Netherlands. So. Um, 
we, we our contribution is not only more on, on business, but it touches also on cultural bridges as well as social bridges and economical uh, that is very important to us as well. A uh, few things to mention, Somalia, the recent report from the EU uh, business uh, that has been, uh, that has mapped out the EU investment in Somalia in 2020-2021, uh, that almost 50 European investors were consulted uh, from June to December last year. Netherlands became uh, the top uh, country, uh, which is significantly represented at 21%, uh, shared first place with Sweden, uh, that European uh, companies that are active in Somalia, the, their origin are from the Netherlands. So whether their managers are uh, European Somalis or maybe Dutch Somalis or maybe uh, any other country, but we are also uh, very much competing when we came back to Somalia in, 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 in many sectors in Somalia to be the top uh, and to, to shine uh, on the top. So uh, the work of Guriga Oranya is focused on facilitation and improving the business and trade between Somalia and the Netherlands, specifically, but also on where needed that we, uh, we can assist on. Thank you very much. Uh, no, thank you so much, Mohammed. And um, it's really insightful to kind of just see how you are not just kind of focusing on Somalia, but also building those bridges with the Netherlands as well. I think it's been quite fascinating to uh, to do that. Um, no, thank you. And um, I think I personally have a lot of questions, but I want to open the floor. So for any comments or uh, for any um, questions, for our speakers or on the, this particular topic in, in particular, uh, with regards to kind of like policy recommendations and, uh, you know, uh, and experiences uh, on the topic of diaspora and humanitarian um, action. I can look at, so you can post your questions here. Yeah. Um, we have a question from Martin Russell. Uh, one comment. Um, so, Martin, please um, unmute and uh, make your comment. Th thanks, Bashir. Um, thanks, Mingo, and thanks, colleagues. Uh, Bashir knows my accent at this stage, so she can she can interpret accordingly. You know? <laughs> no, look, it's great to be here, and it's, it's great to see people virtually connected to Dublin and people in, in town next week. You know, I think Mingo, you mentioned the point about localization as well, and. It's something that we often kind of overlook in, in diaspora engagement. And I can tell a funny story maybe to, to give you a sense of that. You know, we, I remember talking to some people who had come home to Ireland and they went down to the local bus stop. And at the time they had come back from London where they had these bus stops where they tell you that the next bus will be in 10, 15, 20 minutes, whatever it was. And they, they, the person who came home went down and we didn't have those in Ireland. And they said, essentially, what time is the next bus at? And the, the response from the Irish person was, whenever it comes. <laughs> you know? And I think what we're seeing is quite often is you know, those tensions of maybe ways in which we see things getting done in countries of destination or residence and, and trying to maybe implant those back to where we're from. So I'd love to maybe just in time get a sense of reflections about how do we make sure that the engagements that we make are culturally sensitive? Because, of course, the diaspora will have a sense of what's appropriate, but quite often linking that with the formal humanitarian system we have to be cognizant of that. And I think just a, a follow on question that maybe again for later in, in the conversation is, you know, we're seeing with the rise of issues, whether it's Ukraine or different countries or different issues, there's always a kind of a really strong mobilization in the short term, just out of goodwill. So I'm just wondering from your everybody's experience on the panel, is there different types of diaspora engagement that, you know, maybe we can look at to think about strategically, maybe in the midterm as well, and some of these issues that, you know, the, the, the immediate rise of goodwill for humanitarianism is, is critically important, but we also have to maybe take that midterm and longer term view of what diasporas can do. So I just wonder if there's, if there's any reflections on, you know, what works well in that maybe midterm context as well. So there were just the two things that were kind of percolating in the back of my mind. All right, no, thank you so much, Martin. Um, and uh, what I will do is uh, I'll probably get like uh, three, two, three comments uh, uh, or questions uh, at one time, and then we can ask our panelists to uh, feed into that. Um, any more other questions from the floor? If not, I, I do have my questions. I have quite a lot. And I think it's, um, and also it's, it, 
also for uh, attendees as well is uh, is regarding diaspora policies. There's been a lot about kind of that, that kind of structured and trying to formalize this kind of relationship between diaspora and their origin countries. Um, but one thing that tends to be missing is with regards to humanitarian action, it's a missing component. Can this be included? What, how can it be included? What does it look like potentially? So um, I will ask, uh, I will ask uh, Mingo and then Mohammed to just kind of jump in on these two comments. Could you repeat your last question? What does what look like? I'm sorry, I had a glitch. In ah, yes. So diaspora policies um, by you know for by member states in, to include a humanitarian action component. And also the questions, you know, for Martin in terms of the comments, what does that kind of look like in terms of going forward in the medium, you know, the short, medium and longer term? And then I'll go to Mohammed Bashir as well. Please go ahead, Mingo. I mean, I can start if that's fine. Just some general reflection, the cultural sensitivity side, how to ensure that across the board. And uh, while I fully agree with Martin that, that yes, we have the, 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 the assumption and the perception that obviously diasporas are closer to the local communities than the international um, actors are. And I think there's there's like it's a spectrum of being local, local, and then getting further away from the communities that are in need of service. And it's, it's, it's not a, it's, it's, a, it's, it's fluid and it's not black and white and it's, it's a specter. Um, and I, I just think that all of us, it doesn't matter. I mean, whether you're international or you're transnational or you're even national, but working in a specific community, etc., you have to keep that some of the points I made in the beginning, the, the, the respect, the curiosity, the trust, the view on the agency of the people that are in need of support um, has to be in, in the absolute front seat. And um, and you should never out-compete um, existing structures and actors at a local level, whether you're a diaspora or an international actor. That has to be a, a kind of... A, um, an attention point for 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 the way you work. Um, so, yeah, there's no. I don't think there's any fixed recipe other than keeping that self reflection going for everyone. And obviously, diasporas are at a better place than many of the international organizations for sure. But it because of that also becomes easy to sometimes forget that you have maybe lived outside of the country that is now that you're responding in for a decade or two or <laughs> even for generations. So I think that's it's just important to not forget that. Um, and then the longer term lens for the immediate rise of goodwill we see, I think to a certain degree that will come by itself because what we do see in diaspora responses is that it doesn't follow, okay, now we're in the humanitarian sector, then we're going to go into the development sector, then we're going to, I mean, they are by nature um, nexus actors to, to stay in that kind of lingo, which sometimes is horrible. <laughs> I mean, now the goodwill is rising because of an emergency response, but many of the organizations responding now have been engaged before and they will be changing their engagement again after and they will be the wiser for this situation, even horrible as it is, it will contribute to their view on what they can contribute to their countries of origin. So I think that's it's almost a, a natural, but I understand that, that it's something to also think about. And maybe even more so the immediate goodwill coming from where I come from is also how do you make that immediate goodwill get the most constructive lens it can have? Um, and we have a very, um, it's a very picturesque saying on how do you get from teddy bears to relevant humanitarian assistance? Um, and, and that goes for all of us. That goes for civil society engagement, volunteer engagement at large. So I think those are some of the key questions. Um, so not answers, other questions and reflections. <laughs> 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 thank it's you. Always, uh, yeah, no, no, thank you so much, Mingo. Um, before I go to uh, George, can I just ask Mohammed for uh, if he has an intervention or comments uh, on some of these, particularly from your own experiences? What would have facilitated um, these kind of engagement with, uh, so, you know, in Somalia? What could have helped? Would it be a framework, or because you obviously had to use, but well. I shouldn't assume, but personal networks to be able to connect um, to be in Mogadishu and such. Uh, well, thank you very much from uh, from from our example of uh, Somalia. Uh, I hope you can hear me clearly, right? Yes, we can hear it clearly. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Um, 
like like Somalia, you know, if you have been following Somalia's uh, politics lately, you see that the Somalia's got Somalia's cabinet ministers were majority. I think more than half of the cabinet were you know diaspora. So uh, you see the issue of uh, later someone I think Mingo was mentioned. Uh, the issue of who's local and who's diaspora that has played in Somalia uh, has influenced the daily uh, political uh, talks uh, in the past. And but uh, we can highlight that, seeing the fact that many diaspora returnees joined the political uh, you know movement in Somalia and be at the top of uh, you know decision making uh, tables, there are no such as. Uh, policies that the diaspora itself has been taken as as an element to be in the in the, in the policy making. Uh, in the past, we have seen that in Somalia there was uh, uh, I think, uh, more than now uh, 15 years ago there was a, a special ministry for diaspora. But then the issue of federalism in, so- in Somalia has divided that issue, and and you see that people when when they came back to Somalia. They are divided into a system of federalism, or and, and also some some sort of tribe tribalism, which which actually uh, took away the, the important aspect of diaspora engagement. Uh, there there have been many conferences and many initiatives by establishing uh, the diaspora uh, organizations on, on, a, on a nationwide level, but it hasn't been very successful. Uh, but what you see practically is that diaspora. Uh, Somali diaspora are usually contributing back to Somalia when every time an emergency uh, raises in Somalia or something happens in Somalia. Uh, you see that currently there is a drought in certain uh, parts of Somalia and you see huge contributions from the Somali communities. But on policy level, there is no such that uh, diaspora uh, should uh, be some sort of national agency or some sort of you know, a particular uh, policy that is only targeting diaspora to be in the in the in the table of, of, of policy making, but but what you see is that diaspora, you know, since the the collapse of the central government in Somalia, has been uh, contributing to the to the to the to back to to their country and and also helping uh, the country in in difficult situations to get up uh, to get away. Thank you, Mohammed. That was really like important reflections in terms of the kind of like the pr- practicalities of this. Um, I will um, I will kind of continue just taking questions um, and comments, and then we can go back to our uh, panelists. So I'll take two more questions from the floor. So George, please. We're struggling to hear you. Um, what I would suggest, George, is um, if you can post okay, your can, th- that working. Oh, now we can hear you. Yeah, now now we can... No, excuse me. Every every time I unplug my computer and move it, I have everything resets to some default. So excuse me. Anyway, no, thank you very much. Um, just uh, my my question really is to link, I suppose, something that Mingo has said, and then Muhammad as well. Like Mingo spoke about, if you like, the continuum between kind of from the local to the international and. You've got this continuum. It isn't. It isn't a, a, a straight divide between who's local and who isn't. And where humanitarianism is concerned, I suppose what I'm trying to link this is to is to Muhammad's particular background. Uh, you could also say that there's a continuum between people who are in the humanitarian business through people who are in the development business but find themselves suddenly with a sudden onset humanitarian crisis, right through to people who are in the private sector. Uh, through, you know, via, you know, various civil society groups that may not be specifically, you know, um, profit oriented, right through to the business sector where Muhammad is. And in the same way as across that continuum from the local to the foreign, you've got different types of expertise. So you've got the local expertise that helps you to operate in that context. You might have technical expertise that might be a little bit stronger, perhaps at the international level. And in the same way, in that continuum from the pure humanitarian organization across to the business person, I suppose my question is, are there, again, different levels of value added here? In other words, the entrepreneur who goes back to their country of origin or even who operates from outside the country. It isn't what added value is that person bringing as an entrepreneur 
rather than just as somebody who knows the country. In other words, are there particular types of networks that they have that maybe people working in humanitarianism and development areas don't have? Uh, do they have access to certain things that maybe others don't have access to? In other words, my question, I suppose, really is, what is the specific value added of the entrepreneur in the context of humanitarianism, as opposed to the specific added value of the diaspora person? So the diaspora entrepreneur in particular. That's really what I'd like to explore. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I should have actually asked everyone um, who uh, from the floor to just kind of do a brief introduction to who they are or where they are um, joining us from. Uh, so George, maybe you can do that. I, 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 with Irish aid. Oh, right, right. Okay, thank yeah. you very much. Um, and Martin, you will get your chance as well. I will be bringing you back to the floor. <laughs> um, apologies. I have a question from Kony. So I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right. So if you'd like to introduce yourself and your question, please. Bonjour, uh, Madame. Vous prononcez un peu bien mon nom, c'est Kony Lanzini. My first name is Kony. And I work at the General Directorate for Diaspora at the Ministry for Foreign Affairs in the Côte d'Ivoire. On behalf of the General Directorate, I would like to say that every year we are organizing a forum on diaspora in order to gather the contributions of the diaspora. And then we translate it into actions the following year. The third year, there is a feedback workshop to see how the actions have been implemented. The first action took place in 2015, the second in 2017, and the last one in 2019. Since 2018, we elaborated policies to manage the diaspora with the diaspora, and we're working in three different with three different directions. The general direction for the diaspora, the direction for social action, and the direction that is in charge of reintegrating returnees. Our diaspora is participating in the development of our country by contributing financially to development projects and in terms of skills, it is used for um, higher positions in the administration, for instance. We work on these different topics with our various financial and technical partners. At the ministry level, we have projects that are going to be developed, for example, the development of an interactive tool that will allow the diaspora to remain in contact with us. At the regional workshop, we were happy to learn that the African Union wants to finance the diaspora at the regional level. We learned that on the 30th of March. We're also very happy to be accompanied for this matter because this will give a political dimension to our action. These were the few contributions I wanted to make today about the contributions of the general direction for the diaspora that it has been existing since 2014. And we hope to have the same success at the diaspora in Morocco and Mali, for instance. Thank you very much for letting me present my thoughts today and I am available for any questions. Thank you. No, thank you so much. And um, no, it's, it's great to hear about what's been happening in Côte d'Ivoire in terms of you know, policy development and the efforts to kind of engage with the diaspora and facilitating that. Um, uh, what I will do is um, I will now go to uh, to our speakers because I think that there's really interesting points, and this can be also other members, um, uh, other colleagues from uh, taking part can also uh, respond to that. 
I think the questions about um, the labeling of the diaspora, I think is quite a fascinating point, you know, because everyone put diaspora as one, but there are diversity amongst the diaspora. You have those who, are, who have needs, those who can contribute in terms of philanthropy, uh, the different stages of life, generationally, gender, all of this plays a part. But also in terms of uh, skill sets, entrepreneurs, medical, uh, whatever it may be. So I just wanted to hear some reflections from uh, Mohammed and from Mingo uh, on these particular points. Uh, how do you feel about um, the, that kind of use? Mohammed, maybe you can um, start off with that. Um, and then we can go into um, the diaspora policy discussions. Mohammed, please. Yeah, thank you very much. I think uh, what George has said and mentioned in regarding to the uh, value of diaspora when they come, when they go back to their uh, origin countries. I think I can only speak about Somalia, and uh, I think you know, just taking me as an example, uh, my value to to Somalia is because uh, if I stayed in the Netherlands for the past, uh, let's say for the last six, seven years that I'm now in Somalia. I don't think I would have contributed to Somalia much in, in what I am now capable of and what I have done it. In terms of the people I've you know, employed, the, you know, the industry that there was not existing that I created, the number of companies that I helped, and also the uh, public sector that I also gave them uh, capacity, uh, you know, injection in in certain areas that they have not been uh, not that does not existing. So that is me as one example to see the value because one of the greatest value I think from uh, from my point of view is when someone is coming back to invest in the country is because that person he sees the opportunity in the country that someone who's local who has been in the market is not able to see it, or even if he's able to see it, he's not willing to invest it. Uh, and because of the diaspora, because of our host countries, we have been, uh, you know, we walk double than the ordinary citizens that we, we you know, we live in. So for example, my, 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 my classmate is in, in, in Holland. Uh, if they were working for uh, one, one job, I was working two. So because of I'm feeling this connection with Somalia that one day I'm going back to the country and I will contribute. So with that concept, I think it, it, it brings a lot of value uh, to the person itself, uh, himself, as well as to the community that he's from. And, and also to mention the community that you left are looking after you because they, they think you are, you know, you went outside, you got education. They are also expecting some sort of knowledge transfer from where you went. It's not only about, so that is one thing. I think when you come back, you get more access, you get more opportunity as a diaspora, and that, that is a greater value. On humanitarian perspective, uh, the diaspora has, has been always, uh, for instance, Somali diaspora has been always contributing to the Somali, uh, you know, to Somalis back in home. And that has been seen as actually something uh, Blessing, something you know, community is upholding and, and 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 very grateful. So whenever someone is coming back, uh, either is helping the community or building a hospital or or employing someone, it's seen as and 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 people are also providing you these accesses because you are providing you know some sort of value back to the community, which has not been existing existing. But if I go onto the political side. There have been, you know, lately discussions and big talks in Somalia that many diaspora, the most diaspora returnees to Somalia that came for the past 15 years, they ended up getting, you know, positions in the government. And that has been seen and criticized by the local people. That is the downside and the negative side from us, from our perspective, on, 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 on the value. It has not, at the beginning, it was, you know, seeing as something, you know, uh, people were, you know, very uh, looked up to highly motivated. But when they, when they, when, 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 when people found out that majority of those people ended up getting positions in the government, were not, were, were not people who were actually um, good educated or, 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 you know, useful to the, to the, to the country, 
they have been then criticizing. We should get, we don't, we don't, we don't want any more diaspora to be at the, at the, at the decision making because they exploit, exploit from our interests, from our opportunities, but they don't bring it forward. So, so, but I mean, I'm not saying I'm not judging anyone, but I'm, I'm just describing the situation. And, and as George, you know, asked me, what is the value of diaspora when they go back to their country? The value is, you know, they, they contribute a lot to the community and they bring more. Um, Mohammed, that was music to my ears because I think uh, it's so important to recognize. Um, I think a lot of the interest with diaspora has very much focused around remittances, but it goes beyond that. And I think this is where the recognition of diaspora humanitarianism, the skill set, the knowledge exchange, um, uh, these kind of opportunities. And um, it's quite fascinating to see that you feel that you had more impact rather than sending remittances based in the Netherlands, but being in Somalia. Um, you feel that um, to do that. I think it will vary the story. I think for everyone, it will have a different story and individuals. The other point was about the privileges um, as a diaspora. So when you go to origin countries, so if you're coming from the global north, going to the, you know, somewhere in the global south, yeah, you carry some uh, privileges as well with you. So I think it's kind of like that balancing act is quite fascinating. Um, I will uh, we'll go to actually Mingo just to kind of look at your thoughts on that particular point. And then uh, uh, I will ask both of you in terms of your thoughts about what would an ideal diaspora policy would look like. Um, Mingo, please. Going back a little bit, noting down some comments to some of the other questions and comments. Um, I think Mohammed was speaking to the, the lack of space in policy making for diasporas. While they are in the politics and they are in, in the action, they, there's actually no des designated space for the outside of country diaspora being part of the policy making. I think that's a key point. I think it's because we might have a tendency to invest in consultants and people who can write and develop policies. We don't invest enough in real consultation, real participation. It's not innovative. It's a, it's a handy work that you just, you need to invest the time um, into that. Um, then something about um, from, from uh, George on the, yes, the different expertises and all things. And one thing that we have always been looking at is, is, the core difference between, and now looking mainly at humanitarian aid, but also in general international actors, they usually work with specific sets of actions and engagements in all sorts of country settings, while local organizations, diaspora organizations, they work in one geographic setting often, not always. I mean, there is no black and whites anywhere, but for the sake of the argument. And then they work within all sorts of sectors and ranges of activities. And I think that that precisely gives two different skill sets that are highly complementary. Because when you work with the same country setting, the same community setting for years and years and years, and that, that builds something that you don't have when you come as an international actor that just came from this crisis to that crisis. And they bring technical expertise, but it, you need to, I mean, complementarity, complementarity, complementarity. I really think it's, it's such a key word in our line of work. Um, the specific value of entrepreneurs, and I think George asked actually entrepreneurs versus international humanitarian actors. That, I mean, not so much diaspora versus international, but humanitarian versus entrepreneurs, I think is really, really interesting and something that we struggle with, to be quite honest, because it works on different with different objectives. But I think entrepreneurs have a lot of um, 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 Values to bring the, I mean, one, the flexibility in their financing. They simply have more freedom to actually use the money in a way that, that they see fit and that makes sense and that produces outcomes. Um, they are often have much more innovative ways of thinking um, and sustainable ways of thinking. And, and, and I think it's the collaboration between the two, again, is, is, is really important. Um, and, and it makes me laugh because I remember conversations with Onyekachi Wambu from, from Afford UK, who, who, when I met him in the very first place, very inspiring man on that note. <laughs> uh, when I met him in the first place, he told me, well, you, you know what your problem is? You always want to pick the winners, which is exactly true. And it is true for humanitarianism. We, you provide service based on who has the biggest needs, not on where would you get the best sustainability of a business investment. So it's, it's there's a different logic to it, but I think there's also a lot of complementarity to it. Um, so nothing to be thrown out with the bathwater. Um, I love the approach mentioned by the gentleman from Côte d'Ivoire, 
that kind of reiterative approach is fantastic um, to build into your policy making the revision of that and the, the action and revision of the action. I, I thought that was really, really interesting. Yeah, I think that was it. Thank you. Yeah. No, thank you so much, Minge. Um, I'm just kind of conscious of the time, but um, uh, just kind of a quick comment is uh, I'm going to throw it to, for an afterthought for everyone, just think also about the aspirate engagement intergeneration. I think we've been focusing quite on the first generation, but um, and I think Ireland is actually primed on that in terms of they dealing with fourth, fifth, uh, you know, generations. So what does that engagement looks like, and also um, that kind of connection? And what we've seen in our own work and the research is second subsequent generation might not just be focused on origin country, but other forms of identities. So it's something to um, to take the discussions. I know we have. Two questions if we can potentially uh, have it as brief and uh, please um is it Ilhor? Um I'm I'm butchering some names today, so apologies. Uh if you can just introduce yourself um and the correct pronunciation of your name and your question, please. The floor is uh, yours. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Madam uh, Moderator, for giving me the floor. Uh, I represent Ukraine, the uh, state service of Ukraine for ethnic policy and freedom of conscience. We, uh, we are dealing uh, mostly not the diaspora, Ukrainian diaspora uh, living abroad, uh, but uh, with the ethnic communities living in Ukraine and uh, di diaspora of different countries living in Ukraine. And I would like just uh, to inform the participants uh, of this uh, very valuable conference what uh, the representatives of uh, different diasporas doing today in Ukraine in this uh, very difficult for my country time. Um, I, I will switch on my camera uh, because the, I, I see that the quality of internet is not very good here in the plains uh, where I am now. Uh, sorry. Not a problem. Thank you. Uh, just... Uh, for the second month uh, in a row, my country, Ukraine, a home of large number of different ethnic communities representing the diasporas of dozens of countries around the world, is in a terrible situation of a, a hot phase of uh, unprovoked war unleashed by the Russian aggressor. Like all Ukrainian citizens, ethnic communities are suffering from the horrors of the war. The Russian army is bombing peaceful Ukrainian cities throughout whole uh, its territory, destroying many civilian houses and uh, apartment buildings, killing thousands of civilians, including about 200 children. Russian army shells and destroys schools, kindergartens, and maternity hospitals. A number of Ukrainian cities uh, regional centers with a population of almost half a million people, including the ancient city of Chernigiv of 1,300 years old, the city of Mariupol and many other settlements of our country, have been almost completely destroyed by the Russian missiles and air bombs. The capital uh, city of Kiev is also under the intense bombardment. It is clear that not only ethnic Ukrainians suffer, but also Ukrainian citizens of different ethnic backgrounds, representatives of the different diasporas living in Ukraine. Dozens of different ethnic communities live in the country, united uh, in hundreds of uh, community organizations. Many representatives of them are defending Ukraine from the aggressor on the battlefield. Uh, Russia is also shelling the western borders of Ukraine and air raids are being heard in the western regions of my country where representatives of the eastern diasporas of our western neighbors live, of Poland, Romania, Slovakia, Hungary and others. Russia's aggression, uh, which began in February 2014, on February 24 uh, this year, acquired a form uh, that the people, peoples of Europe have not seen since World War II. Unfortunately, I don't have a very precise statistics, but according to the various estimates, up to 5 million people have fled Ukraine in search of peace 
hiding and protecting from bombs and explosions. About yeah. the same number of the people are internally displaced. Among them are many representatives of diasporas. Right. At the same time, representatives of many diasporas today demonstrate good examples of Ukrainian patriotism and courage in defending the country from the aggressor, doing a Thank strong... Thank you so much for that. No, I think it's uh, it's been such a heart-wrenching um, situation and kind of watching it and really appreciate you kind of sharing uh, what's been happening. I think you've raised really important points already in terms of how the Ukrainian diaspora have been doing that. But another point you've raised is about how the, the our diaspora communities in Ukraine who are also... Um, uh, trying to deal with the current uh, conflict. So uh, an example is like with African diaspora in Europe, how they're seeking to support Af um, African students and migrants who are in Ukraine. Um, just wanted to um, ask in terms of what would be um, the kind of, uh, your kind of like comment or your main proposal that you would like to see happen from this global uh, diaspora summit, a takeaway. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, now I can. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, so, sorry, it's uh, just a very bad transmission. Uh, I don't know uh, uh, how it's happened, but just a, a bad quality of the internet. Uh, you see, we, we have very many uh, communities living in Ukraine, uh, dozens, or, yeah. or, uh, and all of them uh, now they behave as a real uh, members of the. Uh, Ukrainian community, as a real uh, Ukrainian citizens of Ukraine. Uh, so they protect their country and they participate in different kind of volunteer work, assisting the refugees, assisting the uh, internally displaced persons. Yeah. And we, we have uh, hundreds of examples of such a very brave and very valuable and needed behavior for my country. And we thank very much to, to our citizens and uh, also to Ukrainian diaspora living uh, in varieties of countries abroad who assist and help uh, my country now. Thank you. No, thank you so much for this intervention. And um, and I think it's in uh, everyone's mind, and I think it's been mentioned here already quite a few times about the situation there. Um, so I think it's important to kind of like just see um, how the response is uh, and such. And thank you, Ringa, for posting about the DMAC report. And I know the European Union Global Diaspora Facility, we did a report with them also around the same time last year uh, with the reflections on the, because European diaspora have been dealing with the situation since 2014. It's not just uh, with the current conflict. Thank you so much for that. Uh, with Before going back to our speakers, I'll, have, I'll take one brief question um, from Eric, um, and then I'll, uh, I'll ask our speakers to do their last intervention before closing this session in about 10 minutes' time. Thank you. Please introduce yourself, Eric. Muchas gracias. Eh, lo voy a hacer en español, aprovechando... Thank you very much. I'm going to speak Spanish because we have this excellent interpretation service. I am Eric Hernández. I am in Mexico City. I am the director of health and sport of the Institute of Mexicans Abroad. We work with 11 million Mexican women and men who live around the world, most of them in the United States. But what I wanted to contribute to this great working group is the following. This uh, Institute of Mexican in, in, uh, Abroad, it was set up in 2003 and is part of the uh, Foreign Relations Secretariat uh, of the government. And we work on different topics. We, we offer services to the community, but also we offer we work on development issues and also engagement of all, all generations of Mexicans who live around the world. The best example is those who live in the United States because around 37 million Mexicans 
Around 37 million people, who, uh, foreign people who live in the States, uh, mo lots of them are Mexican and, and 7 million have no documents to live in the uh, United States or ac have access to health services. So what we try here in, in our organization is to, and with the pressure coming from the diaspora itself, was the strategy of health hatches. We have 51 health Hatches working in the United States. We often um, we often help to people who have no documents in order to access medical support, medical services. So we support them with these hatches, uh, these windows. During the pandemic, we had a vaccination strategy together with the consulates, and as you know, Mexico has the largest. Uh, consular network uh, uh, of any country. We have 50 consulates in the United States who are working together with the diaspora. They exist because the diaspora has demanded it, not because of any government's initiative. And that's important to point out. I don't want to uh, uh, use too much time, but I wanted to also mention that in Latin America, we have diaspora and we have also identified a diaspora with needs in Europe who has suffered because of the pandemic, but also due to the current conflict that Eor just mentioned. So we want to say we support them, we offer our solidarity, and a group of psychologists, women, mostly women, set up a network to offer health, mental health services uh, throughout Europe. And this is offered through the embassies and consulates of Mexico in all the Europe, in the whole of the European region. So this is also an important action, an important initiative coming from the diaspora. And we are supporting not only Mexican men and women, but anyone who speaks Spanish who come to us, uh, to these uh, uh, organizations, if they need support during these times when emotional support is so needed. We uh, have established a, a connection with first, second, and third generation Mexicans. We bring them back to Mexico to reconnect with their places of origin and to become natural ambassadors of our country abroad. I will leave you uh, the link to the Institute so that you may know it better. And well, uh, the uh, Mexican diaspora has made the government work harder for them. We even have deputies, migrant deputies, representatives in Mexico who are the voice and they have, uh, and they have the voice and, uh, in Mexico. Thank and that's you. all from me. Thank you very much. No, uh, Eric, thank you so much. And. Um, it's really insightful and I think you really kind of bring that kind of like that kind of collaboration, how the, the diaspora can work with uh, origin countries, governments. Uh, and uh, I was quite fascinated. I know, I think at one point with irregular migrants in the US, Mexican migrants, there was even an attempt to support them to open bank accounts, access cer certain services that were not feasible. Um, and I think uh, an important thing that has come through as well is when we talk about protection of migrants as well, diaspora play an important role. And I think this is something that tends to, um, and this is why we need to ensure that when we talk about diaspora uh, engagement with origin countries, it's not just focused on the development, but also the humanitarian, because they have become an important resource um, in terms of protection support. And importantly, it's not just about physical protection, it's about mental health and well-being. And we've seen many examples of how the diaspora have been supporting uh, with the COVID-19 response. So, um, and I know there's uh, uh, colleagues here have posted um, uh, some materials on that. Um, we have only about a couple of minutes. So I will ask uh, Minga Mohammed just for closing remarks on these points um, or any uh, responses to that. Um, I know it's a lot and I wish we had more time as always with these kind of discussions, um, but hopefully this will really kind of lead into uh, informative uh, you know, processes into uh, the future. Mingo, um, your uh, one minute kind of... Uh... <laughs> It's maybe not so much a one minute wrap up, but more because on, on the Ukraine diaspora engagement, which is, is really interesting as well, because 
the Ukrainian diaspora is coordinating very strongly with the Ukrainian embassies um, across different countries to kind of coordinate the needs in, in, in Ukraine with what the diaspora can deliver. And I think it's a very, very positive and interesting example of how you can um, engage in, in the constructive coordination of, of aid efforts um, with the government of Ukraine. I think also what's really interesting there is that there is no conflict as such between the government of Ukraine and its diaspora. Going to your the, the labels, the generations, the con. I mean, there's such a diversity, and a lot of diaspora are in the unfortunate position of not being in good standing with their origin, heritage, country governments. That obviously shifts the picture completely in terms of their engagement at policy level, etc. So I think not to forget that that there is big differences there. Um, and then what you mentioned, the generational issues, which I think are extremely important. And we've been working specifically with Afghans and Somalis for over a decade now. And what has been so interesting to see is how second, third generation, et cetera, are challenging the first generation as well. It's it's in many of our collaborations. It's this, it's the generation, the, the past, the, the new, younger generations putting some of the conflicts within diasporas on the table as well. We've had Somalis ask to have seminars on generational conflicts within the Somali diaspora. Extremely interesting. Goes back a little bit to having built the trust that you can actually convene around that kind of conversations that often really have the, the potential to bring a diaspora, a diaspora in quotation marks, further. Um, so yeah, that, that, that was my uh, final remark. <laughs> back to the trust. <laughs> Thank you so much. And Mohammed, uh, just a few more. Uh, well, we actually have one, only one minute. So please uh, just jump in and uh, we'll close the session. Well, thank you, Bashar and Mingo. And I think uh, I should also thank to uh, two gentlemen, uh, Mr. Eric Hernandez and Nikon from uh, Mexico and Ever Ever Post. Very interesting, actually, to learn uh, how Mexico's institution works. And, and I find it very, very fascinating. Also from Ever Post. And I look forward to also engage with them. And I say diaspora is, is, is definitely a tool for development and also collaboration and cohesiveness uh, for both policymaking and, and, and humanitarianism. Thank you. Thank you very much. No, thank you so much. And uh, thank you to our distinguished speakers, to all the participants and for all your inputs and comments. And I wish we had more opportunity to hear from every single person um, here with us today. Uh, with that session, uh, discussion, I will say, uh, uh, we'll close the session for now. And uh, we hope that there will be gonna be more sharing in terms of the discussions and the finding and for the rest of the day. So enjoy please the rest of the summit. I know there's really fascinating sessions. I myself looking forward to seeing later on. And uh, I wish you a, a great day ahead. And uh, with that, thank you. We'll close the session. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. It was a pleasure.